Yeah, what's up, y'all? Welcome to Bitcoin Happy Hour. I'm your host, Colin Harper, and today I am joined by Bitcoin Cass, Cassie Clifton, and also Christian Corollas, also known as CK Snarks on Twitter. Uh, cheers, guys. Cheers. Can't cheers IRL, but, you know, chin chin over the internet. What are we sipping chin, on? Chin chin, bro. It's five o'clock are, somewhere. Are we, are we sipping on some fucking seltzer? Yeah, d- don't judge me, but the finest white I, claw. <laughs> the mango is the absolute best flavor. Is that a Michelob Ultra? Yep, it's uh, from my fridge the last time you guys were in town and someone bought beer and I've still got a lot left. So cheers yeah. to whoever bought this. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so today we're going to be talking about uh, an argument that Ragnar and Dan Held had on Twitter about Bitcoin circular economies or the virtues of ho- versus the virtues of holding. We're also going to be talking about uh, the mining landscape. That's uh, Cass's uh, area of expertise and kind of expectations going into 2020. But before that, I want to give a shout out to our sponsor, Give Bitcoin. Give Bitcoin is the only place where you can both give Bitcoin to those that you love and your friends and your family, and also teach them about Bitcoin why we like it, why we think it's valuable, and why we're so bullish on it. Uh, You can check them out at uh, givebitcoin.io. And what's the referral link, Christian? Yeah, it's it's givebitcoin.io backslash happy hour. Nice. So if you use our referral link, we'd really appreciate it. You should go check them out. Uh, I use them for Christmas uh, this past holiday season to give some friends uh, some some Bitcoin. Also used it to give some of my uh, my family some Bitcoin. Go check them out. Really dope. What's up, Cass? Um, go ahead. I was just going to ask if you guys got like Bitcoin for Christmas or like got any uh, any gifts off your list that were Bitcoin related. I got Bitcoin socks, which oh, were that's fun. fun. Yeah, hey. but I, yeah, but I mainly gave it to people. Yeah, I'm in the stage of my life where I'm doing the majority of giving and not that much getting, but I did give quite a <laughs> bit of Bitcoin. And some people, yeah. I gave them the option, do you want cash or do you want Bitcoin? And surprisingly, a few people said Bitcoin. So I was stoked about oh, yeah, it. Bro. I used that's to give a, Bitcoin. That's actually a pretty good segue into circular economies. I mean, that's the way I, that's the best way to get people into Bitcoin, in my opinion, is just by giving it to them and then making them realize, uh, you know, like giving it to them and kind of having, getting them some skin in the game and they get kind of interested. Um, like a friend staying with me and he was asking questions about it. Uh, and I think once you really start trying to educate people, then you give it to them and they start using it. It's when it kind of clicks. Got to use it, man. Yeah. CK and I, uh, last year when we were in uh, Miami for North American Bitcoin conference, we gifted my cousin who lives there some Bitcoin and, uh, she looked at the price again and she was like, holy shit, I'm rich. That's when Wait, people- how much did we give her? I think we just each gave her like 10 or 15 bucks, but it was you, me, JC. Uh, I think Ely gave her some too. And and then she looked at it again. She got like a random $50 donation. I have no idea how someone found that address that she has and just sent her Bitcoin, but it wasn't us. So <laughs> she's pretty fun. Nice. That, that was, so wait, last January, Bitcoin was like 3K. 3K, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, so uh, I mean, she's up, you know, well over 100%. Yep. Um, I hope she backed up her seed. So Working with her on that. So there's the case for holding, right? Just don't mm-hmm. don't fucking spend it because that shit's worth more. Uh, and I, Christian, I know you're a big advocate. I feel like you probably side more with Dan in this argument. Well, so, it's, it's <laughs> funny that you say that because I uh, I retweeted Ragnar's original thread and I said excellent thread. So uh, <laughs> maybe I'm more open minded than you think. Yeah, probably. <laughs> no, no, you definitely are. So for people who are lacking context, Ragnar basically tweeted out this tweet and i think did he include some of dan's tweets in the, the thread who's, who's he was supposed to be anonymous yeah, yeah but he, like he took I, screenshots of dan's some of dan's tweets or i think they're dan's tweets but he didn't include <laughs> dan held or anything on that he cut right. that out he just wanted the text yeah right but he used it as a textbook example of like like i i would call it blind bullishism where people are just like bitcoin fixes everything and you know this is the michael goldstein thesis that every meme should be positive and Bitcoin is the best thing ever and it fixes everything and you should just hold on to it. Uh, kind of like the, yeah, you know, the cheerleading, so to speak. And Ragnar's always kind of been down to earth about this kind of stuff, right? Like he kind of wants to lower expectations, be a little more level-headed about the limits and the uh, capabilities of this technology. And so where do you want to go with this? Found a drink. Uh, what's up? Yeah, pound the drink. Um, 
I mean, I think there are virtues to both, but I think it's important to like look back at how gold kind of arose simultaneously as a means of exchange and also a store of value because people were using gold, you know, for currency pretty much, you know, congruently with when, you know, people were using it as a way to store their value. Right. Because that's, it it simultaneously had both of those, uh, both of those traits intrinsically when people were using it. Right. Bitcoin's kind of been the opposite where it's been a store of value before it really has been adopted as a means of exchange. You're twisting your, you're twisting your face. I don't, I don't know if it's been the opposite. I think that people, it's all emergent. Yeah. I guess that's the, I guess that's the, that's actually a good point, but I guess what I'm, I guess I foresee people using gold in the early days for a currency before they were using it completely as a store of value. Or again, maybe it was concurrent, but I feel like Bitcoin the the store value use case has been like number one, like uncensorable gold. What are you repping? What are you repping your nodal for? Just cause I'm on I'm on camera. I love always be chilling, dude. Nodal, I, I love my nodal. It's so smooth, like it's it's great. Anyway, maybe we can get. Oh, when did you get one? Show. I didn't realize you had one. Yeah, I got one uh, a while back. Oh, I really nice. really enjoy it. Um. But, but hey, on, on this topic, why don't you kind of because you actually wrote a pretty awesome piece about an example of a Bitcoin circular economy um, in Latin America. Why don't you just hit the listeners with a little bit of those details and maybe we can uh, go from there? Uh, yeah, so uh, the project is called Bitcoin Beach and it's in El Salvador. Uh, it's It was bootstrapped by this dude named Michael Peterson who lived there on and off with his wife. They uh, we're plugged into some local charities and they got a Bitcoin donation and the Bitcoin donor was, uh, told the charity that they wanted to finance a kind of, uh, I don't know, projects that would help bootstrap adoption, but also help people. And so Michael got plugged in with this anonymous whale and ended up uh, starting these projects where they've onboarded teenagers and merchants with Wallet of Satoshi actually for the Lightning Network. And uh, the merchants are accepting Bitcoin with the Lightning Network and they're paying the kids for cleaning up the beaches and lifeguarding and all this other stuff. Um, and uh, it's a really cool program because the, what I, uh, the responses I got from some of the locals there said they've actually seen more people come in and pay. Like they're getting more customers that are paying with Bitcoin, partly because these kids and some of the locals have more money to spend. They actually like, some of them like it better than carrying cash. Uh, so it's, it's this cool kind of circular economy. It's only like 100 people in these two villages between the two of them. Um, but uh, it's about $5,000 circulating at any given time, which is not that much, but you have to consider that this is a developing country. So It's interesting. Uh, so w- what did you say the kids are doing with that money, though? Are most of them holding on to it? Or are they trying to spend it or... It's a little bit of both. Um, okay. And that, that's the that's the thing that I think is cool is like they're they're having to spend it for you know, uh, groceries and you know things like that. Um, what are some of the like uh, I guess like financial inclusion factors there like in terms of uh, like how digitized is that economy in that city in El Salvador? Uh, that's the thing that was cool about it. So I was asking Michael and he said you know uh phones are almost a priority over food for people here is actually the quote that he said it's fascinating uh yeah because like 50 percent of people have smartphones but only 10 percent have bank accounts was his kind of estimate you know so you know, t- mm-hmm. get you know take that with a grain of salt but the point there being more people have phones and actually have bank accounts uh so it's a cash heavy society uh so having a digital wallet of sorts is very good for these people in the sense that it makes money a lot more portable you know and uh in some cases makes it more safe, right? Because you have a passcode. Sure, someone could steal your phone, but they're not going to break your passcode. Uh, you're kind of shit out of luck. I mean, you'll have your seed phrase, I suppose, but then you have to get a new phone, ho- host of other problems. But so it does actually solve a few problems because it is a pretty underbanked country. Um, now, of course, the the pillar of this is Michael and Bitcoin Beach, right? Because like they're providing all the liquidity, which I think is what you're going to have to have to bootstrap these economies is they're, he's basically uh, ensuring liquidity for the merchants if they want to cash out. He's also, you know, the, distributing the liquidity. This is the funds from the anonymous whale to the kids, you know, th- uh, to pay them for things for, you know, doing public works and things like that. Uh, so the next step is trying to get an exchange going where people can start, 
you know, uh, trading with each other and providing liquidity that's not reliant on a single source. Well, here's a thought here, right? It, it took someone hodling to enable the circular economy. Yeah, yeah, it does, it man. Took a I mean, yeah, the, that's the thing is like, I think that ultimately you're going to have both. Like people, you say it's not good as a means of exchange right now. No, it's like you do need to have that consolidation, right? You need to have that store of value phase. Um, and, you know, it'll be a, you know, people will still use it. You know, I've, I've bought things with Bitcoin. I assume that each of us probably at some point has bought, has bought something with Bitcoin, right? And so people will do it, but if I'm going to do it, I'm going to spend and replace, which I think some hodl... Huddle of freaks think is a bad idea. <laughs> so Matt and Marty talk about this on TFTC a lot and this idea of uh, the next step for, I guess, spending Bitcoin are merchants that demand Bitcoin and want Bitcoin more than fiat. And they'll actually offer discounts for Bitcoin, similar to some places offering discounts if you use cash. Um, and just an observation Last year, there was no Bitcoin discount at Bitcoin 2019. So if you were to pay with fiat versus pay with Bitcoin, it was pretty much the same. But this year, we have a blanket $50 $50 discount on tickets no matter what, as long as you pay with Bitcoin. And I've noticed a significant uptick in Bitcoin purchases. Um, I don't know if you follow, like we have like a little ticker that that pings us every time there's a new ticket purchase and it distincts between if it was a event bright versus was it a btc purchase and uh is that, way that way way more bitcoin purchases just in general it's been a overarching trend of this conference for bitcoin 2020 we've had a significantly larger btc purchase ratio and speaking we've been of offering that 50 percent or that 50 dollar discount on bit, bitcoin purchases speaking of that yeah i mean Guys, take advantage of this pump. You want to go to the Bitcoin 2020 conference that Bitcoin Magazine and our company is hosting in San Francisco. Uh, you should definitely go buy some 50% off ticks on uh, Bitcoin. $50. Oh, $50. Uh, oh, is it $50? <laughs> oh, my bad. Yeah. So it was so still a good deal. 25% off. 25% still a good deal. Right now. Um, and still a cheap conference relative to all the other big ones, right? It's 100%. interesting to uh, to me, just like thinking about the, the the Bitcoin discounts, like last year, I don't know that we had a discount, but I feel like people were significantly more hesitant. So I don't know like which factor is contributing to that, like whether or not it's a discount that's like incentivizing people to pay with Bitcoin this year versus last year. But like Bitcoin, when we launched tickets, uh, ticket sales last year, was it like 3K in January, right? And then like, sure, it started increasing in like April and May and like definitely in June when we had that, you know, 13K run up. But at the same time, like, people weren't really wanting to buy Bitcoin then. So like they were wanting to hodl when the price was low, the price, was, then the price like really began running up. And then I feel like people were like, oh, I don't really want to spend it right now either. I don't know if it's like just been a shift in mindset over the last year, or if it's been more of a, uh, like the $50 discount incentive and the more stability in the price, it's kind of led to that change there. I don't know. I think it's interesting though. Maybe I think you're also just going to get a lot of people wanting to pay in Bitcoin for something like this, especially when you give them the discount. And it's so easy to spend and replace now, even if there is the tax burden that I think a lot of people would be fine with that. And plus, I do think that you are incentivized to like, this is what no one ever really talks about is like when Bitcoin pumps, you should be incentivized to buy things because your purchasing power just went up, Yeah. you know, and you want to capitalize on it when it's elevated and then it's eventually going to go back down and you're just going to buy more anyway, because if you're a fucking hardcore freak about it then you're just converting your fiat whenever you have it, right? Like you're hard into to price swings, but uh, I think there are plenty of reasons for why you'd want to spend it. I also think there are plenty of reasons why you're going to want to hold it. Like it's going to be whatever people want to use it for. And that's the beautiful thing about Bitcoin is it's, it's agnostic to use. It doesn't care what you want to use it for, much like cash, right? Or much like anything that you can put your money into and hold. Well, actually, that's well, not true because certain things don't have that same flexibility. But with that being said, you always remember those receipts about like, you know, the hundred, hundred Bitcoin pizza purchase or, you know, yeah. that 15 Bitcoin coffee purchase or, you know, that movie that cost them three Bitcoin and assuming that they spent and replaced, it's fine. But assuming that they didn't spend and replace, you know, there definitely are some opportunity for regretful moments. We had a sponsor for Bitcoin 2019 last year that told me about how they had to spend three Bitcoin to get into Bitcoin 2013 in San Jose back in the day. Right. And that was just ticket to entry. And now they're paying with less than three Bitcoin for a full sponsorship. 
this wasn't like a tiny sponsorship. This is like one of our biggest sponsorships. Uh, so three Bitcoin, you know, in June was, you know, over, well, that was close to 50K, right? So uh, just think about that. Just think about I'm it. value a Bitcoin, man. There's a reason we went off the gold standard, man. <laughs> <laughs> you know well i think that reason was because of uh was because of control and well, yeah, centralization exactly. capital exactly well that's the thing that's it's a i mean uh, that's what that's kind of what i was getting at though is like you know you can't can't keep financing debt on something like hard like that at least not in an inflationary keynesian system but um anyway kind of off topic sorry i just have the fed on the mind because i just finished this massive repo article <laughs> um which is screwed man i feel like this is i don't know like this is warning signs so so question like lightning btc pay server these are things that all bitcoiners are excited about and stoked on but they're really oriented towards spending which is kind of the antithesis of this idea of just hodl and stack like why is it important that we build out this infrastructure if you know hodling is all we advise people to do i mean because you're going to need to have the spending eventually or at least the utility to move Bitcoin fast and use it for certain applications. Like if Bitcoin is money for the internet, that's awesome. Let's have an easy way to spend it over the internet. And that's what lightning is. Um, I think Bitcoin makes absolute sense, like especially for like web plugins um, for stores and shit like that. Um, so I'm when still... you think about like a decentralized content world, you know, like a world where uh, maybe writers are paid by like tipping them on articles, like a, you yeah. know, 50 cents or something per person that views the article. You read my mind. That's exactly what I was about to say. I'm still optimistic on that. I don't know if it's actually ever going to happen. I think you have to kind of hardwire. I know you have to just help people. Mm, how to say it? You have to reboot how we look at content. I think as a culture, because people are so addicted to free stuff now, and like people hate ad models, but they don't want to pay for content. Um, but. Uh, I think that that is one potentially huge use case for something like the Lightning Network. Um, I mean, micro tips, micro, uh, you know, monetizing for content would be huge. But, you know, to answer your question, Christian, I think that you have to eventually flesh this stuff out uh, because Lightning is going to unlock applications on Bitcoin that we can't do with it yet when it becomes more robust and when it becomes more like technically enriched, I think. Cassie, you have any opinions here? Yeah, I would say that like, I think uh, it's great to be ahead of the curve and building it out. My one, uh, I guess, large hesitation that like, there's nothing that we can do on the development side to change this fact, but like every time you transact with Lightning, it's a taxable event, right? So like in that sense until might that not area, be. like- Might not be anymore. Oh, well, yeah, but- The coin center thing, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but like, at least in the US right now, that's going to be seen as a taxable event. And so if there isn't a software to like aggregate all of those and account for them without you, the user, or even the company who's providing the service, having to manually go through and do that. Um, I don't think that like people are going to be incentivized to use lightning in that way. But that's the beautiful yeah. thing about lightning is it's more private than Bitcoin. So you don't necessarily have to let the regulators know that you're doing that. Well, and also like if there are as many transactions as, as we like hope that there will be in the future, then there's no way that regulators are going to, you know, employ yeah. a, you know, multi-thousand person company to keep track of all of those transactions. It just doesn't make sense. Right. No, it Especially doesn't. Especially when we'll, they're, be... they're taxing a, you know, $1 transaction or a 50 cent transaction. It's just. Right. But what will be easy for them to do, which it, it, this is where I think lightning will take off as a service provided by, it's going to be like the, it's going to be like ISPs. I think you're going to have companies like bit refill uh, rivers, probably going to be one uh, basically Bitcoin kind of service providers and financial institutions that provide lightning services for people that are custodial. And they're going to be records of everything that goes on in there. So then if there's ever this kind of like draconian tax um, system where they're taxing every transaction like the United States uh, IRS wants to do, then it'll be easy to do it then. But hopefully most people will be using, you know, something like, uh, I don't know, their own node or something non-custodial like that. But people will fuck their own privacy. They always do. So wait, speaking of privacy, I think one of the main topics that Ragnar was advocating for creating a circular economy and earning and spending Bitcoin is privacy. If the only way to get Bitcoin is to buy it off an exchange that is regulated with fiat, 
Like that's kind of fucking the privacy model of, of Bitcoin altogether. And we already know people don't go OTC. People don't use BISC. It's very hard to get people to mix their coins. And even, even if they do it, it's very hard for them to do it effectively without, you know, leaking information, screwing it up. Um, like that is one of the biggest benefits of a circular economy is like if we got into a world where people never spent Bitcoin and all of them acquired them using their identity, does that destroy Bitcoin? Say that one more time. Like, let's say hypothetically we're in a world and it's actually not that crazy because we are kind of in this world where people only hodl, they only save in Bitcoin, they acquire all their Bitcoin through KYC exchanges and they have no effective way of anonymizing the Bitcoin that they get. Does that ruin the value prop of Bitcoin? Does that make Bitcoin sensible? Does that make uh, people using Bitcoin, Bitcoin users, uh, you know, vulnerable to state attacks? Do you want to answer first, Cass? Um, you can go for Are it you... if you've got something to. Okay. I don't. I don't really know. I mean. Maybe, maybe not. I just feel like there are so many unknown variables at play that I, I don't I don't think so. And I don't think so for the same reason that like the digital gold analogy has to hold up for me. It's like you can buy gold relatively anonymously by going to, you know, pawn shops and things like that. But if you're buying it through, you know, a, a broker or something like that, that's all KYC and people still hoard and store their uh, wealth in gold. And that's the thing about Bitcoin that is actually comforting, though, like it would be fucking like if we want like hyper bitcoinization or bitcoin to exist as like a dominant alternative monetary system then we do need a circular economy but if we don't get that then bitcoin still has a use case so i don't think it necessarily uh, if people were just storing it that way through even kyc things that it would necessarily uh, uh it wouldn't detract from bitcoin's utility uh completely but it, you would obviously lose some censorship resistance there i think but that, but even some. then, you know, yeah, some, right. But even then not completely because you could still always, if it's your Bitcoin, then you could just move it to a new wallet. Like it'd be really hard to just keep blacklisting wallets, you know, if the governments wanted to nigh impossible, honestly, depending on how many users there were. But Cass, I don't know that I have that much to add to that. Um, I mean, it's interesting too, and I know we like kind of briefly talked about this, and obviously there's so many unknown factors of thinking about like when the last Bitcoin is mined, but like if you just think about it from like a, a broader sense to if the last Bitcoin is mined, if we don't have the circular economy in place and people are huddling their Bitcoins, then from there, like is there a, like, you know, is there a, a greater wealth gap in terms of like, you know, a minority still controls Bitcoin and and they're holding it and in that sense it because like they don't want to sell their bitcoin they just want to hodl it so that, like as the price increases but in that sense like it'll become really difficult to create the circular economy um but if there are large wallets holding bitcoin i think that they would have for at least most of them would have to be kyc it a lot of them are like the government would figure out who whose wallets those are um just because of like how ineffective that process currently is so i don't know um so i multi-address kind of uh, yeah, that's why like multi-address wallets are super important because like you don't want someone knowing that you own like a thousand Bitcoin if that ever happens. Right. But like <laughs> what percentage of people are using this? Uh, I mean, I'd imagine. Yeah, I'd imagine the thing is, is like probably the people with the most Bitcoin are using that the most or people who are more interested in the industry, you know, like um, which is actually kind of. I wouldn't say scary when you think about it, but when you see those charts of how many active addresses there are, technically I feel like most people, I don't know, most people who don't care about all this stuff are just storing on an exchange anyway. But- On an exchange, really? Um, I well, think most people who don't care about this stuff, yeah, like if you don't care about holding your keys and like privacy, then you're just like, whatever, I'll just like Coinbase custody my coins. I mean, well, if you're a normie and you're not a Bitcoiner, that's what okay. you're doing. Bitcoin on exchanges is increasing, but- Bitcoin addresses holding um, X amount, like a significant amount of Bitcoin is also increasing. So we're, we're seeing a trend of theoretically more people piling into exchanges and newbies piling into exchanges, as well as more people um, actually investing significant sums and custing yeah. them themselves. So we're kind of seeing like a, a two-way counterforce, mm -hmm. but I think there's probably a good time for, uh, for us yeah, to, to shift 
Yeah, I, was about to say we should I, I don't know it. if you guys are in the chat, but there was a Dovey Wan tweet that I just threw into the Zoom chat um, that I thought was super interesting. Um, okay, I think there's a good segue into the mining topic. Uh, it was a two-part tweet, but she said, uh, USDC is now at a deep discount in the Chinese market, um, 6.91 versus 6.8 or even larger spread. Uh, the possible reason, a possible reason after talking to dozens of local OC, OTC people is that many miners are leveraging collateralized uh, USDT uh, in order to expand their mining capacity. And then to be honest, this is a pretty risky and bold move to leverage on mining given the having uncertainty oh, of weak yeah, performance of price. That's uh, sketchy as fuck. That's but, you know, that's sketchy as fuck. Like in before, like half of the Chinese mining sector implodes because it's bankrupt. Oh my god. I mean, god. but essentially she says that you need to be very determined or very bullish on the size of you know, very bullish if you are making this move. But essentially, all these miners are taking tether, um, tokenized USD, and they're using it to leverage up their positions. Um, yeah, but and- where are they where are they borrowing from is what I'm curious about. Like who are they borrowing from? Shady OTCs. I mean, they're what? they're essentially <laughs> they're essentially selling tether at a discount, so they're not even borrowing. They're just selling tether so desperately to get mining equipment that tether is now trading at a discount. Um, but oh, I think it's said USDC at first. You said USDT. USDT. Okay. USDT yeah, sorry, okay. I'm a bad reader. No, you're Forgive good. me. But uh, yeah, I mean, essentially, is despite all the fud. The people with the real skin in the game and the people operating these mining farms, they are plowing into hardware. They are going online uh, and, you know, they're trying to to get more Bitcoin and they're trying to mine more Bitcoin. What do you well, think about I that, mean, Cass? just thinking about like the network hash power right now, like we're at, you know, 105 terahashes, something like that. i um, trying to pull up the chart from BTC.com, but it's... Uh, I'm looking at uh, oh, we should 106 be. Oh, no, ex- 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 hash hash. second. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Second. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't know why I said Terra. Um, but yeah, okay. so I mean, that would make sense. And that's been in like 7% increase in the last, since the last difficulty adjustment. Um, so that's pretty wild, uh, which would this make sense. Or well, there were, potentially there could have been some miners that were offline before too. They're now going back online since the price increase. Um, I don't know. There's just so many unknown factors there. But also if you think about like, the amount of capital that it takes to like to start a mining operation and to like build out a mining facility is massive. Like you're looking at multi-million dollars in, in terms of capital. And then you think about like what the ROI is, the number of machines you're purchasing, and like you know, let's say it's a year to 18 months, probably closer to 18 months to see an ROI on most machines, then like if you're not building out your facility for the long term then it's really, really difficult to be profitable. But if you are building out your facility for the long term, you're looking like three to five years right now of like locking in some some power, uh, which like already says a lot about miners in terms of how bullish they are and how much risk they're willing to take on. So yeah, and that's the thing too, is like you really got to be bullish because if you don't scale properly and you buy all of this uh, hardware and you don't end up mining at a threshold high enough to where you can pay back this, you know, to keep your operations afloat, then you're just going to end up crashing and burning because like the, it, the the difficulty when it adjusts in two weeks, because there's so much hash rate on the network, the difficulty is going to be brutal and it's going to shake out a lot of, a lot of uh, old machines. Yeah. And maybe, and I'm sure too, like a lot of like S nines or older machines were offline just because it maybe didn't make sense for some of the companies that were operating yeah. at a higher uh, with higher electricity rates to be online at that time. So maybe they went back on also knowing that if they That's wanted what, to, to like recoup their investment on those rigs yeah. that they needed to do that at a 12.5 BTC reward. Right. So yeah, that's what Ethan was saying is that um, now that Bitcoin has become a little more, now that it's rallying, a lot of those older machines were turned on when I was, remember uh, I was writing that article about recent hash rate spike. And that's what he was saying is he thinks that what they believe is a lot of uh, older machines have been turned on and we're starting to see some newer generation ones. They're slowly trickling into the market. Um, I've but also talk- can't- no, go for it. I was going to say, I've also talked to several companies who are like stockpiling S9s right now for the happening, just in preparation for how many, uh, you know, operations are going to be going offline or, you know, potentially could go offline for the happening. Obviously, they don't know, but they're willing to kind of hedge some bets against that and stockpile these machines with like betting that 
betting that the hash rate's going to go down and that you'll be able to capitalize off of the dip after the happening happens and it shakes out some of these older miners. Okay. That's cool. Interesting. And those S9s are cheaper for them too, to buy, right? Like, yeah, it really depends on where you get it. And obviously we're in a super weird place uh, market, at least where the the hardware is tied to the price of Bitcoin, the asset itself um, that it's producing. So, uh, I mean, I'm sure that they've gone up, but when they were, we were in the high sixes, low sevens, we were looking at, you can get S9s from $120 per rig to, you know, 150, 170 bucks. And they're still below 200 for sure right now. Wow. Uh, so if you think about, about that compared to multi, you know, several thousand dollar product it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Sorry, Christian, what are you trying to say? Well, I'm just trying to get a little bit more clarification. Can you, for the listeners, can you kind of break down, you know, what the current, like, what is the most modern, uh, I guess, Antminer uh, ASIC and how does it kind of compare to the S9 and, you know, why are S9s kind of floating around for cheap and why are people kind of stashing these used computers? Yeah, um, I, off the top of my head, I can't tell you like stats, like manufacturing stats on like efficiencies and whatnot. But um, so obviously like the difficulty, one of the main reasons that we've seen the difficulty increase um, over the last few years has been because there's been an increase in computing power that can be put towards the network, right? So uh, that's making it significantly more difficult to find that next block to solve for that, solve that problem. Um, and so we've seen this shift in S9s don't have the same computing power. So they're competing with, uh, you know, these new machines that are able to do it significantly faster. So they're beating the S9s to that, which makes sense in terms of, you know, they, a lot of them have gone offline because it's no longer as profitable for them. Uh, but in terms of like exact statistic, statistics, I don't know those off the top of my head, but I can uh, see so if I can pull some up. I'm, I'm currently on Bitmain's website and uh, they have S9s that are showing an estimate of 13.5 terahash per machine. And then compare that to the new S17 plus, which shows 67 terahash per machine. So yeah. uh, theoretically this new hardware that came out uh, in 2019, end of 2019, uh, or I guess, you know, throughout 2019 is, you know, anywhere from like four to six times better than the old hardware. Guys, I hate to interrupt this. We're at 8,900 right now. Oh, didn't we briefly hit nine? Yeah. Where's the Vegeta Did means? Did we briefly hit nine? I, I, we I almost got there. there but I, like. Yeah. I didn't see that, but I don't know what, uh, Hey, speaking looking? of 9K Bitcoin, Lop just tweeted earlier today that apparently in Dragon Ball Z, Vegeta says he's almost at 8,000, not he's almost uh, at 9,000. So we've been using them, we've been misusing oh, them forever. Says, he still says over 9,000, though, for sure. Like he absolutely says, like, because like he checks it after he's powering up, and Nap was like, Vegeta, where's he at? And then he goes, he's over 9,000 and then Napa like freaks the fuck out like is it like this is like an impossible thing which is hilarious because in the same arc like Frieza like tops like 5 million it's it's ridiculous but you're right Cass we did touch 9,000 um not so or like there that like the like there's a candle where like it just gets to 9,000 and then there's a cell candle immediately down uh from it but Oh my gosh, come on, let's let's get back up there, guys. Ready to rally. <laughs> Ready so to Cassie. rally. So speaking speaking of, like, so we got hash rates popping. Um, people are feeling bullish, you know. Uh is this is this a delusion or is this like is this uh is this a trend reversal, guys? Like are we we, we got the momentum that we had back in uh, the beginning of twenty nineteen back? Bitcoin twenty twenty yeah. pump. <laughs> it's yeah, beginning sure. like yeah, sure yeah three months early <laughs> very bullish hey, you know it, it usually pumps start gradually and then suddenly so end of march we'll be Push looking gradually. at some high bitcoin prices then suddenly hopefully i mean yeah. god willing we'd be above 10k then at least at 10k or god not willing depends on what your position is I'm still in the fiat transformation stage, so. Dude, you stack three times a day. <laughs> I like, completely empathize dumb. with that, Christian. I'm, I wouldn't mind like a, well, actually, it probably wouldn't be great for uh, the ecosystem at large, but if we had like a 3K flash down for five minutes, I'd be all over that. <laughs> so yeah, Cass- I'm, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, I was going to say, Cassie, do you think that, you know, by late April, early March, do you think that, 
current mining op you know a lot of the more efficient current current mining operations are they going to be shaken and squeezed out or do you think that you know price could potentially support them um i mean i think it's definitely possible for prices to support them especially before the happening i think it'll be after the happening that's kind of the interesting thing and i think as many miners will be online as possible up until the happening and they'll try and do everything they can even if they're at a you know break even like cash flow break even versus uh you know working at you know negative cash flows so uh, i think as many as can will try and stay online um and just recoup those those investments up front but it's interesting uh i don't remember the date on this article i want to say it was like the 12th of this month could be wrong there but i recently saw so you know how bitmain uh was uh opening up a site in rockdale right with it was backed by sbi crypto SBI Texas. Holdings company yeah so that uh deal has dissolved like they're still looking at another deal elsewhere but um, from the article that I was reading, it was saying that they weren't able to find, uh, you know, enough efficiencies in terms of the, uh, you know, operational costs for like their electricity rates, as well as like the cost to build out the site. Um, so they're like no longer moving forward on that deal, but looking elsewhere. Yeah, sites. well, they're so going to be hard pressed. That was pretty interesting. They're going to be hard pressed to find cheaper rates than Szechuan, which is like one one cent per, per kilowatt hour. I mean, the, the you lowest get, you can get sub one in, in Texas, you can get sub I mean, one in Washington too. But, but that's what I want. I mean, with natural gas uh, in Texas, you can, but I wonder if they wouldn't have been able to have enough natural gas on hand to actually power the rigs to the capacity that they wanted, because you, it would be a lot of natural gas. Potentially natural gas, but at the same time, uh, well, A, that would have been free because oftentimes like those, those, you know, the carbon taxes are so high that uh, oil companies just want to get that off their hands. But also, um, I think a lot of it would have been wind power from my understanding. Um, yeah, I don't know from, if that's is right. that, is that yeah, what they but, were trying to source? Yeah, I don't, I, the article didn't mention, but like there's a huge surplus of wind energy in Texas. There's a lot of stranded energy there and they're adding another like eight uh, gigawatts, which is I remember you talking enormous. About this. Yeah to the grid in, over the next couple of years. Um, and there's like currently not gonna be really anything to do with it. Not that it's like all gonna be sitting there just stranded, but there's not gonna be a use for all of that energy. So that's just like a shit ton of energy that Texas is gonna have. in like, there are these rural areas where these, uh, you know, turbines are. So it'll be right. interesting. Let's secure the hardest money the world has ever seen. Couldn't we need more, better. we need more yeah. mining operations in America, man. And I think you're going to start. That's one of my bullish predictions for North American Bitcoin scene in 2020 is from 2020 to 2025. I think you're going to see a lot of expansion in the North American mining sector. And we're going to have a lot more activity because like Cass said, I mean, we've got some energy rich areas that are just like dying. I mean, just like begging for Bitcoin uh, mining operations. Maybe we should start one. I think uh there's some definitely some rumors circulating about like manufacturing ops in the US. Um, layer one, I think, is that's on their docket, but I don't know like at what phase in their uh, their you know project implementation they'll actually get to that, whether or not that's you know five or six years down the road. Who's um, layer one? Layer one, uh, the um, Peter Thiel funded. Yeah. He gave them fifty uh, million dollars. Okay. Yeah. For I think uh, that's in, yeah. is it Midland, Texas or Rockdale? I don't remember. I think it's Midland. But um, yeah. Also, I don't know if you guys saw this tweet, uh, but it was like Bitmain's not having an IPO. I think it was potentially Samson's uh, anonymous account. Yeah, I don't really I mean, know. Yeah. What's his anonymous BTC account? King. Yeah, yeah. Dude, BTC King has been slaying Bitmain for a long time, and he's actually been pretty high signal. Yeah. So is uh, that is that uh, is that Samson's account? Is that that's like the bear, right? Yeah. Is that yeah, Samson's yeah. account? I don't know. <laughs> Uh, I I never if, wants, I wouldn't if someone wants me. to be anonymous on Twitter, I'm not gonna be the one to, to out them. The I just them. have yeah, that's you like just a, outed them. <laughs> you well, just, you just indicated yeah, that. Okay, but like I've heard this. What insider before. knowledge do you know, Cassie? I don't know any I don't have any insider knowledge there. I just thought it was interesting because like uh you look at some of the other manufacturing companies that have started gaining market share and like maybe it's they've been gaining market share in china uh I, i'm sure that some of them are in north america as well maybe because they have lower prices and if you think about tariffs and all of that it just adds up so yeah. i would imagine north america has been a, a pretty pretty solid market for them as they've been like entering the space but like canon's ipo is predicted at least on the token insight report that i was reading uh is predicted in 2020 to help them grow their market share um, yeah because they're now you yeah know, they're public i mean canon um, and and Osilicon are definitely gaining traction. And I think a lot of it is because uh, I think personally, 
I don't know if you could chalk this up into conspiracy, but this is what Samson harps on. It's because of uh, the Bitcoin cash bet. Like you you guys remember when Bitcoin cash surged to like $1,300 back in November of like 2017? Like that was because Jihan and Roger were hijacking hash rates. And I think Bitmain lost a fuck ton of money on that bet. Um, And I think that they're probably cash strapped and hurting and one of the reasons why they're probably not doing an ipo is because they don't have enough cash or you know uh, resources for a high enough valuation i think i don't know this uh this report actually says that they so 2019 their market share was like 55 to 58 percent of the manufacturing market and then 2020 is predicted at 63 percent um whoa really yeah so uh here, here, this is what the, the report says. With, uh, <laughs> I think, with Wu Jihan's return to Bitmain on October 27, 2019, and the launch of several initiatives, including installment payment, joint mining, and options hedging, Bitmain is, ex- is expected to, sh- to snatch a greater market share in 2020. I wonder what, but I wonder what their hash rate is at now, like with their pools. Because, uh, what is it, F2 pool broke away, right? Yeah, um, and pool in. Yeah, and pooling, yeah, pool which is good. Like they can keep on making the hardware, I guess. Just r- surrender some of that hash rate. I mean, they're all using the same stuff. They they all but, they also make the software that's uh, yeah. was, that's that's on yeah. the hardware. Yeah, cast. I know that's it. the yeah. problem. I have so many qualms with that. Yeah, there's just so many concerns there for there to be a, an entity that not only manufactures the hardware but also is, uh, you know, the entity behind the pool and, you know, is owns the algorithm. Right. It is uh, basically you can't override it either unless you hire hackers to override the algorithm for you. So to, to break it. Right. So you, you, like, you just interviewed the guys so at Brains. Yeah, that's why yeah. Brains is so cool, uh, man. Super interesting. Sl- Slush Bowl is awesome. I'm super pumped about what they're doing. And it's, it's so important too, because like with these pools, you don't know where the hash rate is being directed right like that's not something that's clear um but also when you own your like you buy this hardware and you spend thousands of dollars on it but at the same time you don't necessarily have complete ownership over it like you can't override things like you can't like you can't reset fan controls you can't turn the fans off um there's so many different like nuances of the machine that the algorithm controls that you don't have access to um so I think it'll be super, super important for the space to to have more ownership there. And then that puts like the ownership of the rig back in the hands of the miner, which was Satoshi's original vision. So Right. I mean, we need to break Bitmain's monopoly all across the board because that is the scary thing. Like you manufacture hardware, software, and you operate pools. But that's one of my big, I don't know. I think we were starting to see Bitmain's grip kind of loosen. And I think that's that the narrative, but is it really? A I lot think of so. altcoin chills will still pound on the fact that mining is centralized in Asia, both in manufacturing and in physical hardware locations. I mean, yes, so, yes, but also they're 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 pulling their hash rate. Another problem is that it's not just Asian miners; they're pulling their hash rate from all across the world because you have people from North America and Europe targeting their hash rate towards Asian pools, and that's another huge problem. So if you gave them other options, which is something that Ethan uh, Vera they're trying to do um, at uh, how do you pronounce it, Cast Luxon? Luxor? Yeah, Luxor pool. They're trying to give North Americans a good alternative instead of like exporting their hash rate. Yeah. Anyway, what were you going to say, I was just going to say, and I'll keep this anonymous because I don't, I don't want to share too much, but um, I had a conversation with a mining God, company. God, such an insider. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that, but uh, I had a conversation with a mining company, company today and they operate in um, North America and they were saying that of the clients that they service, 75% of all of those machines across the board of these clients are Bitmain machines. So they're ant miners. Uh, so I just think that that's interesting to think about. I mean, I know previously I'd mentioned like potentially these other manufacturers are having a an easier time gaining market share in North America, which is still a possibility. But like, I think S9s are still really prevalent on the market and uh, still profitable for right now. And there's a lot of those machines out there. So um, I think that Bitmain still has the a pretty pretty large monopoly uh in the market. yeah on the on the devices for sure but i'm talking about kind of a more holistic look right like yeah. the more you can chip away at how much hash rate they control even if their machines are mining it that's not ideal but if you can chip away at how much hash rate they control and also how much mining revenue they make um 
I'm more I, I'm more worried about hash rate allocation than necessarily who's producing those devices. Though I do want you know Silicon uh, and Kanan and some other big firms to step up and start challenging that. It's also up to users too. I mean, Bitmain makes the best machines, so that's why they have such a market share. But buy other devices. You know, like we need more varied devices in the in the yeah. in the mining ecosystem. Uh, you know, I think that like the hardware of like hardware has evolved so much that it's difficult to say. It really, I feel like it really depends on the uh, the mining company's own needs on like who makes the best machines. Because I've, I've heard different things from different people. Like the what's miner machine, the way that the like the way that the fans are located, they have a much larger like uh, like heat sink. So like the heat is dispersed more broadly. So maybe those machines last a little bit longer. So there's like all those idiosyncratic factors to take into place, not just like from the start of the like initial purchase and like what the manufacturer warranty or like manufacturer uh, statistics say about the equipment and like what it's supposed to be able to do, but also like six months to a year down the road on A, how you're maintaining it and B, like where, like what your uh, your cooling system looks like. Like, is it air cooled? Is it... Uh, using immersion cooling so i think all of those things are sort of like factors you have to consider when you want to determine what is the best hardware for you on, nice. on site shameless well, show but if you guys want to learn more about this subscribe to <laughs> what's happening podcast cassie is just diving deep in all things bitcoin hardware or bitcoin mining and she's getting the best in the business uh so i've been enjoying listening to it and it's pretty clear that you know what's up you're an insider so don't hide it i appreciate that yeah, it's always uh, awkward to shill yourself. So thanks for the for all the shout outs, CK. That's speaking all I do of, is shill. Speaking of shilling ourselves, where can we find you guys on Twitter? If you couldn't uh, didn't already see it above the live stream viewers. Oh yeah, you can uh, you can find me on Twitter at, at @bitcoincast or my uh, podcast at, at What's Happening. What about you, Christian? Oh man, so many places at CK underscore Snarks at POV Crypto. If you want to hear me showdown with an ETH head, David Hoffman at Trustless State. Um, of course, just at Bitcoin Magazine and Bitcoin 2020, you know, just always doing Bitcoin stuff. So uh, Twitter's a good spot for all that. David's like the ETH Messiah, man. Dude, yeah, no, he, he, he is the, the you need ETH to tell legend. Him to, you need to call, tell me he needs to grow out his hair so he can become ETH Jesus. <laughs> is he going to come to Bitcoin 2020? Uh, maybe. I don't know. I haven't confirmed with him. He was at Bitcoin 2019. Had a good time. Oh, did he? Nice. Um, all right, guys. Well, I think this is probably a good uh, place to cap off the podcast. Uh, you guys, in addition to them, you can find again Cassie at uh, Bitcoin Cast on Twitter and Christian at CK underscore underscore at underscore Snarks. You can also find me at As I Lay Hodling. You can find my articles on Bitcoin Magazine. Uh, make sure you follow Bitcoin Magazine and uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel for more podcasts like this one and what's happening. And yeah, we'll catch y'all later. Thanks for tuning in. Bitcoin in Asia too. Happy Friday. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers, guys.